Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Decenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined again by Dr. Tanya Reynolds. She is now an assistant professor in psychology at the University of New Mexico. By the way, I will be leaving a link to our first interview in the description box of this one. So go and check it out. It's very interesting because we will also be expanding on some of the topics we covered there. Uh, and today we're going to talk about men suffering and how people react to it. A female same-sex relationships, uh, discrimination in the hiring process, and a little bit about people's moral reactions to COVID. So, Tania, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on again. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here again. Okay, so uh, from an evolutionary perspective, what would you say are the ways or perhaps the domains where men suffer the most? Well, if we just look at empirical data on men's outcomes, um, we might we might automatically assume men are thriving in society if you listen to <laughs> common narratives surrounding gender disparities. But if you look at the data, um, men are also suffering often in society. So, for example, they are more likely to be homeless, more likely to be incarcerated, more likely to compared to women, more likely to suffer from substance abuse, um, more likely to drop out of school, whether it's high school or not even attend university at the same rates, um, and more, like, more likely to die by suicide. So even if you look at mortality rates, um, men die earlier on average than do women. So by a lot of these metrics, that we use to quantify, you know, thriving in society or suffering, um, men do seem to be experiencing quite negative outcomes. Yeah. By, by the way, are you an MRA in any way? <laughs> because because uh, I mean, people get very, very triggered with this sort of political question. So. <laughs> no, I guess I wouldn't really consider myself an MRA. I think, um, I, which men's rights activists, um, although yeah. I do, um, I do care about men's suffering and I care about the domains in which we're overlooking male suffering, but at the same time, I also care about the domains where we might be overlooking women's suffering. So I guess <laughs> maybe I'm a human's rights activist. It really is not specific to either gender. It's just whichever seems to be um, not receiving um, deserved attention. Yeah, sure. I mean, I just asked, I mean, just to put <laughs> this disclaimer out there. So, uh, I mean, but, but uh, these ways in which men suffer in modern society, I mean, do you think that, or do you have any idea if some of them, most of them, all of them are the result of evolution, or if it's some sort of let's say, evolutionary mismatch and the sort of conditions men live in modern industrialized societies? Yeah, yeah, I think that both um, both are kind of true. Um, so, for example, men throughout human evolution have been in, primarily involved in warfare um, compared to women who are less often involved in warfare. So a lot of features of male psychology and behaviors have been designed to maximize success um, on the battlefield. And in a modern environment where we're relatively safe, <laughs> thankfully we're relatively safe, but you can imagine how that would lead to a mismatch. So if throughout history, one way by which men gained status um, and deference from their peers and possibly preference by mates is through displays of dominance and physical dominance, displays of aggression. Well, in a modern environment where we don't condone those types of displays, there is going to be some mismatch there where some of the desires that men have to gain status are misaligned with our current values. Um, and so I do think that there can be a mismatch there. I mean, there's also just differences in terms of biology. So testosterone, for example, is a um, immunosuppressant. And so that's going to disrupt men's ability to combat um, infectious diseases. So those types of um, 
those types of traits are also going to be harmful and contribute to shorter lifespan. So although there's, you know, evolutionary and biological factors, we can also look at social factors that are harming men's success. And some of my research has dived into that and how we might have these biases that contribute to overlooking men's suffering or being especially likely to perceive them as um, aggressive and perpetrators. So, um, for example, some of my work with um, my a bunch of my colleagues, um, like Carl Aquino, um, Halger, um, Luke Zhu. So we have um, we have a, a project looking at moral typecasting, where we find that men are more likely to be or more readily perceived as intentional perpetrators and women are more readily perceived as suffering victims. And we've also started to investigate some of the downstream consequences of this. And so, um, for example, people are feel less sympathy in regards to men's suffering, feel less moral outrage when men experience suffering, they experience stronger desires to punish men. Um, they are less likely to donate. In a separate paper, we find they're less likely to donate to some of men's causes, um, and they're more inclined to donate to female causes, and they are also more likely to vote for politicians talking about um, women's afflictions in society, even when those descriptions of the afflictions are not actually true. So we manipulated whether the politician was talking about men's suffering in society or women's suffering. And when talking about men, it was actually correct. But yet people did not like that politician talking about men's suffering in society. And they preferred the politician talking about women, even though the statements weren't even correct. Um, so I think that this tendency to see men as perpetrators and to less likely view men as victims does contribute to lower sympathy for men's suffering. Yeah, I mean, that's very interesting. Even sometimes it just came to my mind that, for example, a while ago, I was listening to people who, who do work on sex workers and how, for example, in the US, there are some states where politicians really are, I mean, they put out new laws, uh, increasingly draconian laws, let's say, against, for example, sex trafficking. But uh, I mean, people say that uh, some of it is with moral intentions just to to condemn sex work in general. And I mean, even sometimes it seems to me that even when some women don't see themselves as victims, society for moral reasons or perhaps some of these evolutionary biases that we have put uh, women in victim uh, roles, even if they don't consider themselves to be so. So, I mean, that, that's just a side comment. But uh, any, anyway, since we're talking about moral typecasting now, is there any evolutionary rationale for it, for why people have this sort of bias of uh, classifying men as perpetrators and women as victims? Yeah, we, we suspect so. So if you think about um, reproduction, women are basically setting the upper limit on reproduction due to internal gestation in the female body. So if you have a group comprised of relatively more women, um, compared to relatively more men, the group that has more women is going to be able to produce more offspring. Um, it's also the case that, you know, so many processes need to go right in the female body for uh, reproduction to unfold successfully. Um, so for those reasons, I think it makes sense that natural selection may have favored these psychological tendencies or motivations to protect women from harm. Now, also, you could look at this um, from an air management perspective. So it is the case that men are the primary culprits of physical violence. So if we're just looking at base rates, men are um, perpetrating the majority of homicides, um, physical assaults. So perhaps when harm is at stake, human cognition kind of errs um, in the direction of preventing the costlier air. So it might just be safer to assume men are 
the perpetrators out in the world because base rates back that up. And although that's true in terms of base rates, it might mean that we simultaneously kind of overlook cases where women are perpetrating harm. Um, and then conversely for suffer suffering victims. Although we might have motivations to um, protect women from harm, these might make sense in terms of um, ensuring reproduction, but this might lead to cases where we overlook men suffering from harm. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's now talk about the ways people denigrate men. I, I mean, men and women have evolved uh, traits that people tend to consider the most valuable in each sex. So is it that when people denigrate men, they target those traits that are the most valuable for men themselves and that people also value them the most? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it would make sense that if you want to insult someone or harm their social status, yeah. you should select the traits that are considered valuable. Um, so Buss and Dedden have some good work on this, looking at um, what traits men and women derogate in their same-sex peers. And so <laughs> they find that um, men derogate one another in terms of their financial resources, their achievements, and their financial goals. So they might say, you know, he's poor or he lacks ambition. Um, they also tend to derogate one another one another's ability to dominate each other. So they might call um, call the guy, you know, weak, a wimp, a coward. They might say that they could um, dominate him in sports. Um, and so these are suggesting, these patterns are suggesting that men, when they derogate one another, it's emphasizing traits that not only women value in mates, such as like um, access to resources, but also physical formidability, which women do care about, but it's probably also especially important in the context of male intrasexual dynamics. So if throughout history, men were um, more often involved in warfare, then they're gonna care about traits relevant to the coalition. So are you enhancing the likelihood that our coalition will succeed in warfare? So traits like courage, um, and physical prowess are going to be more important. So I, I'd be curious if this is more of a domain where other men might care about the relative ranking and women might care as well. But um, so, and this actually ties into some of the, some research that I have on, on friendship preferences. So I looked at with, with my colleague, Jamie Palmer Hogg, um, what traits men and women care about in their friendships. And we found, at least for men, um, when they were more likely to question a friend, uh, friendship, it was primarily surrounding traits that were relevant to coalition. So um, if the guy lacked courage or if he was afraid to take risks or wasn't very athletically skilled, which makes sense that if these are the traits that are valuable in coalitionary competition, men's modern men's psychology might be designed to kind of attend to those traits and how valuable of a contribution this man would likely be able to make. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, perhaps it all boils down mostly to two different categories, perhaps ability to acquire resources and physical traits that are typically masculine, right? I mean, most of, of the, the traits that you say that people target in men all boil down to perhaps those two categories. Yeah, yeah. And I and I think especially when we talk about even like the the physical prowess, I think that's a domain a domain that we don't often think about. So usually when we talk about like society critiquing our bodies, it's used in the context of women talking about all of these expectations to fit this like thin ideal or these beauty standards, which are there and those are challenging. But I think another parallel might be, for example, height or muscularity among men. So men are more prone to being dissatisfied with their muscularity and height compared to women. And that's a domain where I, I'm not sure that it gets the same attention and people feel more comfortable derogating that, which to me just seems just as cruel as it would be to derogate a woman's body.
Yeah, I mean, I guess Naomi Wolf, when she wrote about the beauty industry back in the 90s, missed completely that <laughs> men also do not like that much to see muscular men on magazines. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, it, yeah? I mean, at, at least the muscularity, perhaps that one is less painful because maybe that is perceived as more under one's control. But I think height is the one that uh, just... Seems yeah, yeah. Especially right. cruel. Yeah, and I mean, probably much more women, uh, much, uh, many more women care about uh, the, the height than the mus the muscularity itself. I would say. Yeah, yeah, I would imagine muscularity is more about signaling to other men your coalitionary <laughs> value. Um, I'm not sure women, um, and I believe they they have data that women don't care to the same degree that men do about men's level of muscularity. Yeah. So going back to men suffering for a bit, do you think that we are generally insensitive to it? I think I think it, it it's possible that it could be domain specific. So, for example, I have some colleagues in the UK, John Barry and Martin Seeger, and they recently came out with this paper showing that although people perceive men as more responsible for finding work, avoiding workplace accidents and how depressed men feel. They found that people perceived women as more responsible for being physically fit and preventing their children from experiencing um, accidents on the playground. So it's possible that these this ins insensitivity to suffering is domain specific. I think we need more research to more clearly delineate, okay, in which contexts are we insensitive to men's suffering and in which contexts are we insensitive to women's. Um, I'm hoping to conduct some of this research with my UK colleagues um, because I think, you know, it's probably the case that there are just domains where both are true. So for example, if we tend to perceive men as more agentic on average, that can be um, detrimental when we're, when if that inhibits our ability to see them as victims. But if we're thinking about in the context of like a boardroom or in the voting booth, it can be advantageous to be seen as agentic. And so that might be a domain where women are not appreciated as fully. Um, so I, I think that probably both sides are kind of right in their own respective ways and talking past one another because they're focusing on different domains. So I think it'd be nice just to have a, a more thorough investigation of the specific domains where we overlook both men and women suffering. Yeah, that's an important point because that was a question I was just about to ask you if there were perhaps some domains where people were also generally insensitive to women's suffering. So. Yeah, and I think, I, I think your example about um, kind of women's perceptions of women's sexuality might be a good, mm -hmm. might be an interesting domain where there are um, probably stricter expectations um, that are harder to conform to. So both this demand to be sexually alluring, but also to be sexually chaste. And for the women who are embracing their sexuality, um, Jamie Krems has cool work showing that we have a hard time seeing them as, you know, happy and fulfilled, no matter even if you tell them, you know, they're enjoying their lives. So that might be a domain where, like you were saying, we kind of force them into this, this victim category to their own detriment, you know? So it, it's probably even the case that we might over perceive um, victimhood and that can even have um, harmful re repercussions. Yeah, by the way, I've had Jamie Krems on the show recently. So if you guys missed the interview, go and watch it. It's very interesting. And we talk about same sex relationships, particularly for women. So, and, and that's the topic we're going to get into now precisely. So you, you have a recent paper, uh, Our Grandmother's Legacy Challenges Faced by Female Ancestors Leave Traces in Modern Women's Same-Sex Relationships. So could you tell us what were some of these or perhaps what were the main challenges faced by women in our, during our evolutionary history that perhaps left a trace in how they conduct their same-sex relationships? Sure, yeah. 
So if we think about um, throughout history and across cultures, male partners investment was critical for children's survival. So Dave Geary has great work showing that um, kids are more likely to perish if they don't have their father present and investing. And so what that meant is that the women who were able to secure the commitment and investment from men um, would have been more likely to watch their children survive and flourish than women who mated with men who didn't have resources, so they were unable to invest or unwilling to invest. And so what that meant is that the women who more strongly matched the preferences of men or men's families, if men's families were more involved in selecting partnerships, um, then these women faced better chances at pairing with these men who are capable and willing to invest. So relative differences among women in the domains um, considered most valuable by either men or their families became quite consequential. Um, and so this not only shapes women's romantic prospects, but also their likelihood of being able to protect their children from peril. So this was a big deal, especially in contexts where women didn't have the same access to resources. They couldn't just go out and earn an income. It was, they were much more dependent on men's um, provisioning uh, throughout history. And so this, these pressures um, led created incentives for women to compete with their same-sex peers for advantageous mates. So they, this competition um, was primarily focused on, you know, better displaying the traits valued by potential mates. So this could be um, physical attractiveness or um, sexual chastity, especially for long-term context. Men ten tended to prefer sexual chastity. Um, but this, so not only were women trying to better display these traits, another way of appealing <laughs> relatively more desirable is to harm your same sex peers appeal in these valuable domains or possibly their access to resources. Um, so women might be more inclined to derogate the traits that are valued by men. So they might be more likely to call one another promiscuous or unattractive. Um, so not only are they, you know, kind of competing with one another to attract investing partners, they also had to compete to protect their partnerships from interlopers. So even if you secured a romantic relationship, well, that relationship is still vulnerable to mate poachers. So um, David Schmidt has great work showing that across cultures, uh, men are more likely than women to succumb to affairs and to replace partners. Um, men are also more likely to commit infidelity. Um, and so this posed a threat to women's established relationships and their ability to care for their offspring. Now, that being said, although women were one another's primary romantic rivals, they were also crucial sources of support, childcare, um, information, resources. And so not only were women kind of, you know, in competition with one another for uh, social resources and male investment, but they were also opportunities for aid. So women, who were able to secure the support from their same-sex peers would have been um, more successful in supporting their children, gaining the resources they need, um, compared to women who totally just felt competitive with their same-sex peers and didn't even attempt to form affiliative bonds. So, so the, the fact that it seems during our most of our evolutionary history we lived in Petri local societies, did that have any sort of influence in the kinds of traits that women seek in other women when it came to their same sex relationships? Yeah, I, I suspect that it did. So genetic analyses suggest that the food producing groups, um, the agricultural groups were largely patrilocal. Um, and this is supported by the um, anthropological evidence um, supporting a larger proportion of societies exhibiting patrilocal residence patterns. And so what this meant is that upon marriage, many of our female ancestors um, left their natal groups to go reside with their husbands, meaning that they were surrounded by unrelated individuals 
upon marriage. So they were living with people that they may not have known and who had few genetic interests in their well-being aside from the children they produced with their husbands. So essentially women are living around these in-laws and if modern day in-law relationships tell us anything that <laughs> these relationships can be fraught with conflict. Um, and so women are surrounded by these strangers. So Dave Geary argues that they used reciprocal altruism to uphold their um, relationships or at least reciprocal exchanges. So um, kind of benefits being exchanged in a tit for tit manner, but they also might've used mutualism. So mutually aligned goals. Um, so co cooperating when goal interests align. Now, if it's the case that um, women are upholding their relationships in this um, through these reciprocal patterns or through mutualism, then threats to symmetrical reciprocity may have underlined, uh, undermined their cooperation. So if, for example, one woman has way more status and resources than the other, then it's unlikely that they are going to have mutually aligned goals. Um, so, and indeed what you find is a variety of sources of data suggest that women tend to prefer symmetry in their relationships. So as just one example, um, women tend to more often prefer equal distributions of resources and power compared to um, unequal ones or equitable merit-based distributions. Um, another, another way to avoid you know, selfish exchange partners. So not just a partner who doesn't have any goals in common with you, but also you kind of want to avoid partners who are not going to in, uh, engage in fair exchanges. So one way women might have avoided these types of selfish partners is by avoiding those who are very competitive or status striving, those who are, you know, looking out for their own gain. And what you find is that across cultures, competition more strongly predicts conflict and dissolution among female relationships compared to male relationships. So male friendships were better able to continue on in the presence of competition compared to female friendships. Um, Joyce Benenson has some awesome work showing that even in the context of modern day sports where competition is the explicit goal, female athletes are less likely to engage in affiliative behaviors following a competition suggesting compared to male athletes, um, suggesting women might find it challenging to return to cooperation following competition. Um, I argue that beyond avoiding competition, women might also have an active preference for kindness because not only does avoiding competition um, or competitiveness um, help them avoid selfish exchange partners, but if you perf actively preferred kind partners, you might be more likely to secure relationships with generous um, reciprocators. And indeed, research finds that women list kindness as the most desirable trait um, in a same-sex friend. And compared to boys and men, um, girls and women tend to hold higher expectations of their friends overall, but especially in domains like trust and empathic understanding. But even beyond kindness, if you had a preference for interpersonal devotion or commitment, this would allow you to detect the direction of one's altruism. And so um, indeed research finds that women tend to prioritize um, kind of cues of commitment in their friendships. So they prioritize trust and loyalty compared to men. And if you give women a trade off between um, having many friends of low intimacy versus having few friends of high intimacy, women tend to pref prefer intimacy, stronger intimacy with fewer friends, um, suggesting indeed that women are attending to cues of commitment in their friendship. So um, basically because women's relationships weren't buttressed by shared genetic interests, they aren't surrounded by their kin, they had to put kind of more um, active effort into fostering these relationships and had to attend more closely to, you know, how likely is this person going to defect and how much can I trust this woman? And so I argue that this 
has led to a preference for you know kindness and commitment and a dislike of some of those self-interested motivations um, such as you know competitiveness and status driving among women when they're selecting um, same-sex friends mm -hmm. okay so talking about same-sex relationships there was one thing that just came to my mind i'm not sure if you touch on that in your work or not but Okay, so assuming patrilocal societies, a guy gets a new wife, she goes and lives with his family. A particular kind of same-sex relationship I was thinking about was the relationship between uh, the woman and her mother-in-law. So because uh, what, did, what came to my mind was that there already on the show I talked with people about parent of spring conflict and many times uh, the interests of the parents and their offspring are not aligned in terms of the partners their offspring chooses. So in that case, I mean, the men could have chosen a wife whose traits did not align with the preferences coming from his mother. So, uh, and I mean, it's interesting because I don't know how, how we how how things. Uh, are, are in the US when it comes to that, but here in Portugal, it's very frequent that you hear women complaining about their mothers-in-law and also men, but whatever, since we're focusing on women here. So, I mean, do you look into that specific sort of same-sex relationship or not? Yeah, there, um, there are a few sources of data um, lending some support <laughs> to your um, predictions that, yeah, that, oh, okay. that, that relationship is especially fraught. And um, so there's some anthropological work, I believe, where they found, um, I forgot which group it was, but what they found was that the, um, the husband's family, so the especially the mother-in-law, would make often these like demarcations between her family and the new wife. So kind of just like not not trusting her and like reminding her that she is outside of the family. And a lot of times what they were worried about is that she would go home to her family and kind of gossip and share the family secrets. And so they didn't want her leaving um, their family group and returning to see her family because then um, it risked ex um, exposing some of the, the family gossip. Um, but also you see patterns in, um, in modern modern and industrialized contexts where again the relationship between the daughter-in-law and mother-in-law do seem to be particularly um tense but i still think that there could be more work con conducted on that in light of you know parent offspring conflict so uh, yeah, it would be yeah. really sweet to look at how like i wonder if mother-in-laws express you know, disappointment that their sons didn't end up with the mate that they were they were hoping. And maybe there is more conflict to the degree that the son didn't listen to his mother when selecting a partner. Um, so I think that more work could totally be done on that. Yeah. Oh, I cook better than you, you silly little girl. You're, uh, my son loves me more than he loves you. So, I mean, that, yeah. kind, of, that kind of silly <laughs> thing. Uh, I, I mean... Uh, and now, uh, let me just quote you, uh, uh, I mean, quote you on your paper, because the, this is a very interesting quote, and I would like you to comment on it. Uh, Women may therefore have developed strategies to achieve both competitive and cooperative goals, such as guising their intersexual competition as prosociality or vulnerability. So could you explain this? Sure, yeah. So... If we think about the challenges women, ancestral women were facing, they were both encountering strong incentives to compete with their same-sex peers for provisioning and committed mates, but also there were incentives to attract um, and secure cooperative relationships with female allies. So if there are these, this confluence of two pressures, both cooperative and competitive, then the women who developed strategies that facilitated both goals, both cooperative and competitive goals, should have, you know, had more and more success. However, I think that if we look at so some of the ways that women 
tend to compete, um, they often use some of these indirect strategies, indirect aggression, like, you know, gossip um, and spreading rumors. But if you look at the patterns, people really strongly dislike overtly negative gossip. Um, so there are social costs to engaging in the competitive strategies that helped women get the resources and partners that they that the, that were advantageous. So if it's the case that women who use these strategies are disliked, then perhaps the way that women's competitive strategies manifest might actually be kind of cloaked in more pro-social terms. So um, for my dissertation, I looked at one strategy to um, disseminate gossip and whether women use professions of concern, like, oh, I'm just so worried about her. Uh, she's been sleeping around a lot and I don't want her to get hurt. Um, and I did find support that phrasing your gossip as concern, um, you still are able to transmit the same, you know, negative information. We're still learning about someone's sexual behavior in that example but it carries fewer social costs. So people are more likely to trust individuals who phrase their gossip as concern and um, they're more likely to desire them as social partners. Um, but also I have looked at in a recent paper that I just submitted with um, Jamie Palmer Hogg, we looked at women's friendship preferences and whether these might be functioning both in cooperative and competitive ways. So I talked about how women have preferences for kind and committed um, same-sex peers, but if women's preferences for kindness and commitment are amplified, then these, these demands, these expectations, these really high standards for their same-sex friends might also allow them to transmit gossip in a way that's not readily recognized as gossip. So essentially, by being especially sensitive to same-sex peers' transgressions, this could offer women reputational advantages. So if you take offense to your friend's transgressions, especially those indicating commitment or kindness, you can then transmit this information to others without it appearing like gossip. So. I could say, for example, if I wanted to destroy someone's reputation, I could say, Becky's such a cold-hearted bitch, but I look mean if I say that, right? You're just like, ooh, that was harsh. Now, another way that I could convey that same information is if I said, you know, Becky's really let me down as a friend lately. You know, when I tell her about my problem, she doesn't say anything supportive. She also knows I'm insecure about my weight, but makes a point of talking about how much she's proud to be skinny. It just feels like she doesn't care about me. So I've basically led you to the same conclusions about Becky, that she is insensitive, she's uncaring, um, but I didn't, I don't appear quite as mean. It doesn't appear as overt gossip. So in, in my paper with um, Jamie Palmer Hogg, we kind of tested this. So we looked at, are women more sensitive to transgressions in their friendships? And would this sensitivity offer advantages? And so what we found is that women were indeed more likely to question a same-sex friendship following cruelty or commitment violations. So cruelty being like a friend making a joke at your expense or making a point of talking about all the positive traits they have that you lack. And then commitment violations being like, you know, they never reached out to check on me or um, they never share personal information with me, never ask me how I'm doing. So cues of loyalty. And not only were women more concerned about these types of transgressions, they were also more likely to disclose those violations to others, suggesting that the sensitivity kind of compels repetition of this social information. And then we looked at, okay, let's say you say these stories, you share these stories in either the first person narrative, so Becky was really mean to me, versus a third person narrative, so Becky was really mean to Tina. We gave participants these types of scenarios where we manipulated whether it was first person or third person. And what we found is that if it's first person, people were less likely to consider that gossip and they perceive it as more appropriate to tell suggesting that we aren't really recognizing these first-person disclosures as a form of gossip, um, which 
kind of makes sense. We might think like, oh, it's your story to tell. If, if, if Becky were, you know, mean to you, that's your lived experience. Who am I to question that? Um, and then we also looked at whether these um, types of disclosures are more effective for women or men. So we manipulated whether it was a female disclosing the poor treatment of her female friend or a male, um, a male disclosing the poor treatment of his male by his male friend. And what we found is that people felt more sympathy for the female victims, um, which also translated into stronger disapproval of their female perpetrators. So this suggests that this type of strategy is more effective in shaping the social reputations of women compared to men, which makes sense, right? If, if men are preferring um, traits like courage and dominance in their same-sex peers, and if women are attracted to those traits as well, then talking about your own victimization is probably not a way <laughs> to get mates or friends as a man. So it's just not as effective of a strategy. Um, and so I think that what's really fascinating about this is it, it's perhaps another way by which women are kind of achieving both cooperative and competitive goals. If you're super sensitive to the way that your friends treat you, not only are you going to select advantageous allies because you're going to choose kind and committed friends, but also you're going to be able to disclose, you know, reputation harming gossip in a way where you aren't viewed any more negatively. You're not seen as, as gossipy. Um, and so I think that this could contribute to, you know, kind of what my arguments about self-deception, that if women are, there might be strategies that allow women to compete without women's, you know, conscious awareness that that's what they're doing. So when I'm telling a friend, when I'm saying, you know, she really hurt me, I'm not realizing consciously that I'm spreading rumors and disseminating gossip. But when everyone starts disliking the friend who treated me poorly, she might realize, oh, wow, my reputation has been destroyed. And so that might make sense of why you see this pattern where women tend to claim victimization by gossip and rumors, but tend to deny their perpetration of it. It might be the case that we don't realize that perhaps most of the gossip is being transmitted in these ways that we don't readily recognize as gossip. It might be through these more um, indirect channels, either like concern or through discussions of our own victimization. Yeah. So would this also, this sort of dynamics of same-sex relationships, particularly on the female side we've been talking about, does this also apply in modern contexts like for example something that i think is very different now is a very different context nowadays than the kinds of contexts we moved in during our revolutionary history that is for example the work environment would we see these manifesting itself there as well yeah so um there's been a, a decent amount of work um conducted in more like the organizational sciences looking at um predictors of employee satisfaction um and you do find some of these same patterns manifesting in the, those contexts so for example um there was one study that looked at like 1700 employees and they found that among minorities um, women reported more support from their male supervisors than female supervisors, as well as more optimism about their potential for promotion. So they didn't find these biases among male employees, but they found them among female, suggesting either that their female support um, superiors are truly not being um, supportive, so it could be accurate, or it could also be a bias if it's the case that women have these really high standards for kindness and commitment in their female peers, then it might be really easy to feel as though your female, um, I guess, superiors in this context aren't supporting you. And so this suggests there is something going on in the female-female um, relationship in the workplace. Um, they've also looked at, you know, who um, making, um, when making scholarship and hiring decisions, um, they found that women tended to more negatively evaluate the attractive female applicants. Um, and so this suggests perhaps some of these, you know, mating aspects of mating rivalry kind of bleed over into these domains that we consider removed from, you know, competition for mates. 
Um, they've also looked at, so Benenson has done some work with uh, academic researchers and found that senior female researchers were less likely to co-author publications with same-sex junior faculty, um, whereas male senior researchers didn't show this tendency. So they were just as likely to collaborate with younger males where it was the, the senior females that were less likely to, to collaborate with um, junior females. And so I think this gets back to perhaps this preference for symmetry in the relationship. So if women upheld throughout human history, if they upheld their relationships through these like um, either mutualism or reciprocal exchanges then having a partner of similar status and resources is going to be helpful. It's, it'll increase the likelihood that your goals align and it reduces the likelihood that this will just devolve into parasitism or exploitation. And so it's interesting that you're finding these patterns where they're in the modern workforce when there are overt demarcations in status, it seems to be corrosive to female competition. Um, and again, there's also similar work in academia where um, female university faculty perceived their female doctoral students, their PhD students, as less committed to their careers um, than the male doctoral students, whereas the male faculty didn't show a gender bias in their evaluations of their doctoral students. So again, this similar pattern where there's a discrepancy in status seems to possibly undermine cooperation among female pairs. Um, and in the organizational literature, they even have a term for this. They'll call it the, the queen bee syndrome. So it's well, it's well known that there are difficulties with cooperation among modern women. And so I think it's important to take these kind of evolutionary lenses because without that, you might just look at this and be like, ugh, why can't women, you know, get it together? And you might not understand it. But if you take the evolutionary lens and you think about, well, it was really hard for our female ancestors to figure out who they could trust. If they're around strangers, it's challenging to know who you can count on. Yeah, you know, I mean, especially if we consider like if you're letting your friend care for your child or if you're hoping that someone doesn't tell your husband that you cheated on him, you know, throughout history, that was a really big deal. So you needed to accurately ascertain who was super committed to you and unlikely to defect. So I think with that lens, we can have more empathy and understanding to why these patterns might be manifesting and perhaps maybe work towards, you know, addressing them maybe through interventions. Yeah, we'll get into the, those interventions. But before that, let me just comment that perhaps this is also telling about stereotype accuracy, because, for example, in this case, uh, I've already heard lots of women complaining about their female colleagues and saying that they preferred working with men than women, even though there's things like sexual harassment and, and stuff like that. And I don't think I ever heard the men saying that they care that much about the sex of their colleagues. So, I mean, I, I don't know, perhaps the people are more correct than they are wrong when it comes to that stereotype. So uh, anyway, uh, ab about the interventions you mentioned, I mean, do you think that this knowledge about how same-sex relationships work for women in this case? Do you think that that could help people uh, navigate their own modern same-sex relationships? Of course, this could get us into complicated questions of free will and something and, and stuff like that. Because, for example, I've had Martin Daly on the show and I asked him if he thought that educating uh, young people to the risks of them, for example, in the context of high inequality, young males seeking more uh, violent means to getting uh, sexual partners, let's say, if teaching young people about this, if it could perhaps, I, I mean, perhaps undermine some of those strategies and lead them to choose other more long-term orientations or something like that and he told me that he didn't think that at all that may, that he only thought that uh, social political economic conditions would be the thing uh, 
to do the the work there so what do you think about it in the in the case of same-sex relationships yeah i'm cautiously optimistic i think we could at least give it a shot and you know at the end of the day whatever the data say i'll go with but I think that we could take some of this logic and design interventions based on it to see whether they're effective. So if we know, at least from the work with um, Jamie Palmer Hogg and, uh, and my work are suggesting like, um, okay, women are really attending to cues of like commitment and kindness and they're sensitive to these types, per, these perceived violations in their friendship, then one intervention that might help foster cooperation might be to, you know, kind of promote forgiveness. So challenge women to overlook these perceived defections. Um, perhaps one way you could do this is by having them, you know, think about all the ways in which your friend has demonstrated that she's been a loyal friend to you. Because my guess is if we were challenged to think about that, we could come up with context where, oh, wow, she, you know, she was really there for me, you know, when my grandma died or she did send me that thoughtful birthday gift. So maybe refocusing attention like, oh, here are all the ways she's demonstrated loyalty. Perhaps it's not so big of a deal that she, you know, gave a cue of defection in this one context. Um, I think you could also um, have women think about the times that we've let our friends down and think about what were our motivations and probably we weren't intending to harm anyone. So if I forgot to wish a friend happy birthday, it wasn't because I hated her and wanted to signal we're not friends anymore. It was just because I was busy and, you know, not thinking about that. And so I think that could be um, helpful, but also making women aware that if they have these really high standards for their female allies, then maybe focusing on that in the context of a work environment. So for example, when I receive a really terse email from a male peer, a male colleague, am I as likely to question whether he likes me compared to if I receive a terse email from a female colleague? So it might be the case that we unknowingly are kind of holding our female colleagues to this different standard where we might be like, oh, why did she include a, pun or a period instead of an exclamation point and smiley face, you know? And so we might be expecting different types of behaviors from our female colleagues that could be holding them back. And so I think because women do tend to care about um, or many women care about, you know, promoting female success that if we phrase it this way, like, hey, like if we really want to help women in the workplace, maybe one way of doing that would be kind of lowering our standards for commitment and kindness that, you know, we don't need to expect our boss to be our best friend and care about, you know, our dog dying. We, we need to hold them to the same standards that we're holding our, our male bosses to. Um, and then in terms of you know, gossip. I think that if we wanted to help people or reduce gossip, we could, you know, kind of let let women know that gossip isn't operating the way we often think of it. So we have perhaps a stereotype of what gossip looks like. And it's like, oh my God, did you hear what she did? What a slut. But that, uh, according to some of, you know, my research, it suge suggests that it's not really operating that way. And so perhaps if we are aware that gossip kind of manifests in these pro-social terms or through, you know, our personal victimization stories, then maybe we'd be better able to catch ourselves like, oh, do I really need to share this, this story right now? Or at least be aware of like what that is doing. So when I express my concern over my friends, I'm not perhaps not even helping them at all. And so it's counter, um, it's, it's undermining my ostensible goals. Um, but also, I mean, for ourselves, I think that we could use this information to help select partners who aren't going to gossip about us. So if it's the case that um, a lot of these, you know, or if one form of gossip is through this personal victimization narrative, then this might help us attend to who's likely to be a gossiper. So if, for example, I have a friend <clears throat> who's always telling me, oh, you know, Susie did this to me, Becky did this to me. Um, and they're, if I have this friend who's always getting hurt by other people, then maybe that's a sign that they are a risk and I will inevitably let them down as well. And so perhaps that's probably not a person that I want to be around if I'm trying to avoid my reputation being destroyed. And so we can use these patterns to, <laughs> for ourselves to figure out like who's likely to be the one to gossip about us. And so if someone's always getting their friend or their feelings hurt and they're always disappointed, 
then we probably aren't going to be an exception to that experience and we will likely let them down eventually. And so it's just worth being <laughs> informed about that possibility. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So perhaps somewhere in the future, when you put into practice some of those strategies, let's see if they work or not, or if people really do have some sort of free will and by learning how they, op how they operate and how others operate, they are able to better their relationships or not. So uh, a another topic now, you've studied uh, discrimination in hiring context. So what sorts of discrimination have you studied and why did you decide to do that? Yeah, we looked at um, some race-based discrimination. So this is a project with my um, colleagues, uh, Carl Aquino and Luke Zhu, and we looked at race because it is a very relevant topic currently. So if you look at um, discrimination, race-based discrimination charges alone, over 28,000 were filed in 2017 alone. So that suggests, or at least in the US, that suggests that many individuals are perceiving that they've been unfairly treated by their organizations on the base of race. And discrimination when it comes to race is a pretty difficult issue because what constitutes fairness is subject to varied interpretations. So as one example, um, affirmative action is a controversial policy used in hiring and promotion decisions. Um, and so people who defend this policy say that it's fair because it promotes diversity, it rectifies historical injustices, and it compensates for systemic disadvantages um, faced by members of certain groups. But to critics of affirmative action, they perceive it as leading to pernicious forms of reverse discrimination. So people are denied opportunities on the basis of group membership. And so as just one example of how the relevance of these issues, there's a class action lawsuit um, filed against uh, Harvard University right now on behalf of Asian applicants who are claiming that the school discriminated against them by requiring higher SAT scores and GPAs, um, as well as evaluating them less favorably on like, the personal qualities. Um, and some investigations support that there were asymmetric criteria for applicants based on their race, racial membership. So it's a very relevant topic. Um, and so we were interested in looking at some of the psychological predictors of race-based discrimination. Yeah, I mean, perhaps some of the people who are not really fond of the idea of affirmative action would be the ones that have more of a meritocratic ideology or something like that, where they think that maybe uh, people, who, we we are not promoting the people who work the hardest or have the most or are the most talented, but perhaps just promoting people based on their race, gender, or something like that. Yeah, yeah, I believe there is work showing that like um, preference for meritocracy does underlie opposition to affirmative action. Also beliefs yeah, yeah. about like, you know, like the Protestant work ethic that just like hard work pays off. Um, so those types of belief um, lead people to perceive the policy as, you know, more unfair. Yeah. So, uh, and talking about ideology, in what ways does ideology and uh, what I, I, I think you borrow this word from Nietzsche, ressentiment. What do those two things predict when it comes to discrimination in hiring? Yeah, so for this paper, we were kind of in, inspired by the dual processing models that suggest two distinct pathways through which people form judgments. So one involving a more deliberate and conscious processing, and then the other involving more like automatic and effortless processing. Um, and so we looked at two factors. We looked at ideology, which um, refers to kind of a stable system of beliefs about the proper ordering of society and how to achieve that order. 
And then we also looked at Rizanti Ma, inspired by um, Nietzsche and moral philosophers. Um, and we were looking at this experience, which kind of um, encaptures this enduring hostility and resentment towards those who are in power as kind of the more affective or perhaps non-conscious um, processing. And so in terms of ideology, we, we used social dominance orientation as our measure of a person's commitment to either an elitist or egalitarian ideology. And social dominance orientation basically is assessing the degree to which individuals accept and endorse the legitimacy of hierarchical social structures where some groups dominate others. So for people who score high in STO, um, which indicates more of an elitist ideology, they might see you know, disparities in social status as kind of natural consequences of variation in motivation or abilities or talents. So inequality from this perspective might be kind of an inevitable outcome of these differences among individuals and among groups. Whereas low SDO scoring individuals tend to adopt a more egalitarian ideology. So they do not view higher hierarchical discrepancies as legitimate. So they might instead believe that all members of demographic groups are equally endowed with socially valuable traits. And so they therefore might be more motivated to equalize outcome among groups, perceiving that as the fair distribution of opportunities and resources. And so we hypothesized that elitists who tend to see, you know, hierarchical social structures as legitimate would be sh would show partiality towards white applicants um, because they have traditionally been associated with higher status in society, at least in U.S. society, they ha tend to have more wealth and more positions of power. Whereas we hypothesized low scoring SDO individuals, the egalitarians might show preference instead for the black applicants because black um, racial membership has been associated with lower status traditionally and lower opportunities for power, lower income. So we looked at that as more of our like deliberate conscious processing, but we were also interested in Rizanti Ma, um, inspired by Nietzsche, and he his concept of Rizanti Ma kind of underpinned his slave morality, which he argued was about elevating the moral stature of the weak and the oppressed and castigating those who ha held power in society as evil. And I know you just recently had someone um, on the podcast who talked about um, this philosophy. So <laughs> they did yeah, a Yeah, but I, I think you're referring to Brian Laser, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, and so according to Nietzsche, he argued that individuals experiencing Rizantima, they can't easily discharge their grievances. So even though they experience hostility towards the social elite, the elite are often amorphous and dispersed, but also powerful. So he argued that they would instead engage in acts of kind of imaginative vengeance. And so Following Nietzsche and others' conceptualization, we treated Rizanti Ma as kind of this enduring hostility towards the powerful in society. And we hypothesize that those who experience stronger feelings of Rizanti Ma towards the socially powerful might engage in imagined vengeance towards the elite by instead preferring members of traditionally low status groups, um, in this case operationalized as black applicants relative to white applicants. Um, including in decisions about whom to hire. So in our studies, um, we looked at, we um, randomly assigned participants to evaluate either a white or black applicant. We held their qualifications constant, so they had the same education, same work experience, and then we looked at their evaluations. And what we found is that those participants scoring higher in SDO, representing an elitist ideology, evaluated the white candidate as more suitable for the positions than the black candidate. 
whereas participants scoring low in SDO, endorsing the more egalitarian ideology, tended to evaluate the black candidate as more suitable for the position than the white candidate. And then we also found that for those scoring high in ressentiment, they also tended to prefer the black over the white candidate. And so these findings <clears throat> suggest that people on both sides of the ideological spectrum exhibit race-based preferences, um, and, that, and that also that these feelings of hostility towards those in power can perhaps manifest in this elevation of low status individuals relative to higher status individuals, which is congruent with the philosophical speculations about how this um, experience manifests. And our, I think our findings suggest that if, if an organization is interested in promoting impartiality, so kind of even handed evaluations of applicants or employees for promotion, that the individuals kind of scoring at the midpoint of SDO, so neither egalitarian nor elitist, are perhaps going to be more fair in their evaluations, as well as individuals scoring lower in Rosantima. They might tend to be more unbiased or impartial. Um, and in our latter two studies, we did find that like a brief intervention was actually helpful in promoting impartiality. So we asked participants like, um, how do you think a data-driven algorithm would make this hiring decision? And we forced them to think about that and write a few sentences. And that was actually effective in eliminating some of their ideal, ideological and Rosanti-Ma-inspired um, biases. And so this suggests that kind of remarkably, the human mind is capable of reasoning, you know, as, you know, only attending to the data and reasoning dispassionately, we just kind of have to step outside of our more humanistic <laughs> impulses to reach those even-handed decisions. Okay, that's great. So yet again, Nietzsche gets vindicated by psychological science. And so, <laughs> guys, please stop reading Freud, go read Nietzsche. It's, it's much better. <laughs> so. Uh, anyway, do you think that the results you got for racial discrimination would also apply to other kinds of discrimination, like sexual or others? Yeah, that's a great question. We haven't looked at it, but if the logic holds, which is that this is about groups traditionally associated with higher low status in society, then you would predict a similar pattern such that perhaps those scoring higher in Rosantima might show a preference for sexual minorities. They might show a preference for women. There are data um, by Carl Aquino and Zook, uh, Luke Zhu showing that um, these similar kind of patterns with um, with SDO that we found, such that those scoring lower in SDO do tend to show these um, preferences, um, more favorable uh, evaluations of like women and racial minorities. But yeah, I think whether it extends to sexual minorities is an awesome question and open direction for future research. So I think that there's a lot that can be done with this. And it's it's kind of fascinating because we do tend to focus a lot on, you know, perceptions of social inequality, and yet uh, people haven't really looked at kind of Nietzsche's arguments about Rosantiman, how this might play out in a modern context. We still have these feelings of hostility and resentment towards the social elite and how these might influence our decision making. Yeah, great. So, uh, and I'm very much looking forward to that. So, uh... <laughs> You have studied also recently the moralization surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic. So in what ways did people or do people, because it's still an ongoing process, moralize this issue? Yeah, this was a project with Maya Grasso and Fan Chen, and we were uh, we hypothesize that because COVID is a formidable and pressing threat, still is, um, efforts to eliminate it have been moralized. So moralization is this process by which attitudes 
attain moral relevance. So once an attitude has been moralized, it's then perceived as kind of a fundamental question of right and wrong. And it's often these claims are perceived as objective statements of fact that are universally applicable. So all individuals should share the same moral conviction and those who do not are morally suspect. So we sought to examine, okay, if COVID elimination has been moralized, then perhaps people would show greater tolerance of the collateral damage associated with these elimination pursuits, and then possibly as well condemnation or moral outrage towards those who violate or even merely question the value of these elimination efforts. So combating COVID-19 kind of inevitably involves trade-offs as every response carries negative externalities or instrumental harm. So if we fail to combat COVID, then it leads to increased cases, overwhelm healthcare systems, health complications, and deaths. However, if we prioritize COVID elimination, this could also carry costs. So people might be less likely to receive, say, cancer diagnoses if, you know, medical systems are prioritizing COVID cases. There's social isolation as a result of the lockdowns and quarantine. Unemployment, underemployment, extreme stress, substance abuse, and left unaddressed, these forces could generate deaths of despair where individuals perish, from either behaviors or worsened illnesses as a result of these perceived bleak prospects. So say if you're a small business owner, you're watching your profits, you know, deteriorate and you're struggling to support your family, this can be very challenging. Your source of meaning was perhaps providing for your, your family and this could lead to, you know, extreme anguish and possibly, you know, a death of despair. So we were interested in how do people evaluate human costs and do they show asymmetric weighting of human costs depending on whether those costs result from COVID elimination efforts? Um, and so in our first study, this was in a US context, and I should note that these studies were conducted prior to the um, development of a vaccine. So we uh, randomly assigned people to uh, scenarios in which there was human costs either as a result of COVID elimination efforts or not resulting from COVID elimination efforts. So for example, in one of our scenarios, um, there was a statistical modeling error that either over or underestimated the spread of COVID. And when it overestimated the spread of COVID, hospitals rejected non-urgent um, but potentially serious patients who didn't have didn't have COVID um, and so they rejected them because they were anticipating this abundance of COVID cases. And so we said as a result of this modeling error um, and the hospital mismanagement, 34 people were hospitalized and one person died. And so in the reverse condition, people would see an underestimation of COVID threat. So um, hospitals were underprepared for the sudden influx of COVID case cases. And then as a result, you know, 34 people were hospitalized and one person died. So in these cases, we held the suffering and harm constant to look at how the source of the suffering and harm influenced responses. So um, in another case, a police officer like abused his powers and um, inappropriately fined 15 people and detained one person for violating stay at home orders because he wanted to reduce COVID fatalities or in the other condition, he um, inappropriately fined and detained um, people because they were violating traffic laws. So we're holding harm constant and then manipulating the source of the harm. So what we found is that people were more willing to accept the social health and human rights costs. So like the police abuse of power in that case, when those costs resulted from COVID elimination efforts. Um, and then when these costs resulted from efforts unrelated to COVID, participants um, showed stronger moral outrage and stronger punitive motivations towards the responsible parties, and they eval evaluated the responsible parties as less competent. So this suggests that we're differentially evaluating people um, based on their motivations, and we give them kind of a pass 
um, if they're trying to eliminate COVID, and we evaluate the same type of suffering as less problematic if it results from COVID elimination efforts. And then in study two, we looked at, okay, what happens if someone just merely questioned controlling COVID elimination efforts? Um, and so we were inspired by Tetlock, who's done some cool work on sacred values, showing that when values become sacred, they kind of transcend secular scrutiny. So even questioning these values is considered reprehensible. So for example, if I asked you, how much money could I pay you to sacrifice your child? This would be considered reprehensible to even contemplate this, like, well, how much money would that be worth? Because it's questioning the sanctity of human life and you know parental devotion. So we looked at, okay, if COVID elimination efforts have been moralized, then perhaps even questioning them is considered reprehensible. So for this study, we collected data from New Zealand residents, um, and that was because um, New Zealand hadn't shown the same degree of uh, political polarization um, that was seen in the US regarding COVID, but also um, New Zealand had, at the time that we collected these data, had kind of effectively eliminated COVID. They'd been quite successful. Um, and so this allows us to kind of see our effects generalizing to other contexts. Um, and for this study, we uh, randomly assigned participants to evaluate one of two research proposals where the researchers were merely hypothesizing that suffering resulting from elimination efforts outweighed the suffering um, from abandoning those elimination strategies or vice versa. So in one condition, they're saying suffering as a result of trying to eliminate COVID is higher or, as a res or the reverse. Um, and so we held the information presented in the proposals constant. So they were presented in an identical structure and we based them all on established COVID-19 findings. So for example, um, in one we might say, recent findings show that deaths by COVID are remarkably uncommon among people under 65 years of age and those without predisposing conditions. Whereas the reverse would say something like, Recent findings show that deaths by COVID-19 are quite common among people over 65 and those with predisposing conditions. So the, they're both factually accurate, it's just a difference of emphasis. And so what we found is that when the researchers merely posited a hypothesis that human suffering resulting from these, eliminate, these elimination efforts kind of outweighed those from abandoning elimination, Participants viewed the information in the proposal as less accurate. They perceived the research team as less competent, less admirable. They even evaluated the writing of the proposal as worse. So this was measured by questions like, is it clearly written? Is it free of grammatical and spelling errors? So they evaluated the proposal as worse, as well as like the methods. So they were less likely to say it was rigorous and, and based on logical hypotheses. And they also perceive the research as less valuable for society. So you can't even ask this question, it's not worth knowing. Society doesn't need to know the answer. And then we also looked at a behavioral measure of endorsement of the research. So we gave participants a dollar at the end of the study and they could allocate this dollar to New Zealand charities or the researchers accounts to continue studying these COVID questions. And so when the hypothesis was that these elimination efforts are resulting in more suffering, participants donated less of their dollar to the research account. Um, and so it, this is supporting like moralization and kind of supporting that perhaps it's even risen to the level of sacred value where we can't even ask these questions from an empirical standpoint. So just conducting the research is viewed as you know, less appropriate and less valuable for society. And so this can be problematic if for those you know, aiming to design policy, if we can't truly quantify suffering even handedly, like we're not even allowed to ask these questions. Um, and so it suggests that research seeking to kind of examine the negative externalities of these approaches might be under underfunded or, you know, undervalued or dismissed altogether. Yeah, so uh, that's all very interesting. I was just wondering if you think that 
these moral stances that people adopt when responding or reacting to health responses, in this case to the COVID-19 pandemic, if they stem in any way from pathogen disgust and if perhaps the differences you see among people would stem from individual differences in disgust sensitivity? Yeah, yeah. So we, I mean, one of the reoccurring threats throughout human evolution is the threat of pathogens. And so it, we have evolved a system, both um, psychological and behavioral, of kind of avoiding those types of threats. So I know you had um, Randy Thornhill on your, on your show, and you know, a lot of his work has shown um, kind of the consequences of the this vulnerability to pathogens for our psychology. Um, and so it, in context, for example, where there's more risk of uh, pathogen spread, if there's higher um, rates of infectious diseases, people are less, um, even their personalities are shifted such that they're less like open, less sexually open, and also, you know, tend to be more conservative, distrusting of newcomers. And so it's quite possible that these patterns have played out in the current pandemic. So I know that I know that there's some research finding that um, kind of perceived vulnerability to disease predicts greater support for these public health measures and um, as well as um, one's own preventative behaviors. Um, and in our studies, we found that individuals who felt greater concern about contracting COVID were more likely to show these asymmetries in their evaluations. And although this isn't like perceived vulnerability to disease, it's perhaps a proxy for it that people might be, for whatever reason, sensitive to their own vulnerability and responding in ways that reduce the likelihood that they are exposed to this um, to this pathogen. And we also did find um, political ideology as a moderator of our effects, such that individuals who scored higher in liberal identification showed stronger asymmetries in their kind of acceptance of human costs and their evaluations of the research proposal. So those who were more liberal were more willing to tolerate costs that resulted from the elimination efforts and were more likely to denigrate the research proposal questioning those elimination efforts, which is kind of interesting because it perhaps goes against some of our expectations about what conservatism is. Um, but we suspect that it's possible that these disparities might be um, a result of liberals greater emphasis on avoiding harm and then perhaps conservatives greater valuation of just personal liberties. Um, so perhaps those moral domains are what most strongly um, kind of were manifesting here, but it is kind of perplexing if we think about, you know, conservatives more often being the ones sensitized to cues of like pathogens and disgust that you wouldn't have seen greater conservative like endorsement of these, you know, lockdown measures and elimination efforts. Yeah, that's right. I never thought about that because conservatives tend to be or to express more uh, disgust sensitivity. So, I mean, yeah, it would in fact make sense for them to be more in favor of uh, stronger health responses to this, but yeah, 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 it makes sense. But so, so yeah, the other values you mentioned probably are the ones that best explain these differences. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense. So, uh, just one last question, uh, and I know you're not a dis uh, disgust researcher, but I mean, I always ask this question whenever I have someone talking about disgust on the channel, particularly evolutionary psychologists and biologists and behavioral scientists who are who study also humans i mean uh, and since there's also in your work this sort of connection between responding to a pathogen and our moral stances and moral values around uh, responses to it uh, do you think uh, when it comes to that debate going on in the field uh, I mean, if there's a separate domain of disgust that's called moral disgust, or if there's only sexual and pathogen disgust, and then 
the morality surrounding those questions is something that uh, is not another domain of disgust, but something else? I mean, do you have any position in, when it comes to that debate? Yeah, I, I mean, so I think that, I, I guess I'm agnostic about uh, which is the case. I could see, I could envision, I mean, so path pathogen and sexual disgust makes sense in insofar as those are like delineated threats that pose challenges for our ancestors. And so it makes sense that to some degree those could be, you know, distinct systems that evolved to solve different challenges. Now, um, as to whether morality is kind of like moral disgust is, you know, kind of co-adapting them or, or utilizing those mechanisms, it, I'm not sure. I don't know enough about disgust to have a strong sense. I do think that I'm um, I'm open to kind of um, Kurt Gray's arguments that a lot of morality is about harm detection. And so I'm not sure if perhaps that is <laughs> supporting or refuting the argument that moral moral concerns are, you know, rooted primarily in the, these disgust systems. Um, so yeah, I, I honestly don't know. I'm I I don't have enough knowledge in that area to say. Okay, fair enough. So uh, where can people find your work on the internet? Yeah, so um, they can find me on Twitter. Um, my handle is Tanya Arlene, and I have a ResearchGate account. Although I think I recently got in trouble for having my articles up there, so I don't know how many they took down. Um, but yeah, um, and then I also have a site at um, the University of New Mexico. Okay, great. I will be leaving all of that in the description box of the interview. And then, yeah, again, well, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. And I hope to have you again on somewhere in the future. So. I would love that. Thank you for the opportunity. It was a lot of fun. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching the interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please consider supporting the show. It's thanks to people like you that it keeps running. I will leave links in the description box to Patreon and PayPal. Any amount, even just $1 per month, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share the interview, leave a like, and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Peruga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Glinkby, Matthew Whitting, Bernardo Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Kalenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Ruth Gervoz, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Newberger, Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbo, Jorge Pinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Robert, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Dugny, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Ivan Bodrenk, Wal Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslan Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Weira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yassil Adez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dermiti Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roff, Yannick Punter, Adana Ruzmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidi, Sam Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, my producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafini, Akion Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Vanegdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Guidi, Sardes France and Thomas Trumbull, and my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano, and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.